Hi, I'm Laura Chandler, host of the Sacred Stream radio podcast, and my guest on the show today is CEO and co-founder of Sandy Hook Promise, Mark Barden. Sandy Hook Promise is an organization dedicated to preventing gun violence that was formed by the families who lost loved ones in the wake of the Sandy Hook school shooting in 2012. Since the death of his son Daniel in this tragedy, Mark has dedicated himself to creating a platform that advances gun safety, youth mental health, and violence prevention. Sandy Hook Promise has been key in helping pass nonpartisan legislation at the state and federal levels through inclusive partnerships, diverse grassroots education, and community mobilization. In addition to his work with Sandy Hook Promise, Mark is an accomplished musician, and today we talk about his family, his work with Sandy Hook Promise, and a new documentary about him, A Father's Promise, by filmmaker Rick Korn and executive producer Cheryl Crow. We also talk about his latest project, a series of concerts with his all-star band featuring Jimmy Vivino that will tour the country raising funds for grassroots nonprofit organizations fighting gun violence in their communities. You'll find out more about Mark and Sandy Hook Promise in the links below. Please be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share this video. And thanks for watching. I'm here with my friend, Mark Barden, father, husband, musician, and co-founder of Sandy Hook Promise, a nonprofit organization created in the wake of the Sandy Hook school shooting in December of 2012, and that's dedicated to preventing gun violence. And we're gonna be talking a bit today about his work with Sandy Hook Promise, his music, and a new film about Mark that will be released this December. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's really an honor. It's great to see you, and it's great to participate in this uh, in this important conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for making the time. And I thought we'd start with um, talking a bit about your work with Sandy Hook Promise, um, what you're doing, what the organization is doing, um, and and where it's going. So how much time do we have? There, there's a lot to all of that. It's always a challenge how to distill that into something that's uh, it's consumable in sort of a bite size, but I'll do my best. And, you know, as, as you said uh, in the intro, um, my, primary, my primary job is that of husband and father uh, to my three beautiful children, James, Natalie, and Daniel, and, and then the, the, have the good fortune to uh, make my living with what I love, which is, which is music. And my wife, Jackie, is a school teacher, and we had carved out uh, a, a, just an a idyllic little life for us as Jackie teaching and me doing music and raising our, our three kids here in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. And all, whether you know or not, all of that changed on um, December 14th, 2012, uh, when, when a gunman shot his way into Daniel's elementary school and, and shot and killed 26 people, and one of them was was our little Daniel, and um, that that is uh, that is an event that has changed me as a person, changed us as a family, and um, <clears throat> has really kind of subdivided my life into these two two sections. And subsequently to that, um, music was kind of spun off into the ether for me. It wasn't, I couldn't even think about it. It was basically survival for those first weeks, months, you know, maybe till, maybe that continues now, but um, the priority was, was to maintain some kind of balance and love and nurturing community for my family in, in our home to the best of our ability uh, in, in, in the wake of such devastating tragedy and, and trying to be supporting of James and Natalie and help them navigate this as, as the best of our ability. And the reality of it is, is that it turned into them helping us as much as we, we were helping them. And uh, we we're so fortunate to have a large and loving family and a wonderful community that wrapped themselves around us and supported us and buoyed us and helped us navigate those moments from one to the next. And in the midst of all of that, uh, folks in our community were gathering and, and gathering and, and and grappling with some of those same questions and ideas of like, how did this happen? What happened? Like, what did, what were the mechanisms that, that led to this catastrophe? And could it be prevented? Like, can we stop this from happening again? And that was something I was very interested in exploring. Um, 
I, I needed answers to those questions. And I wanted to know if this was something that could be addressed and unpacked and um, the drivers be identified in a way that we could we could course correct uh, in, in if this were to happen again, before it happened again. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really kind of the nucleus of what became Sandy Hook Promise. Um, and 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 we, we've been on a, a, a journey of listening and learning from, from those early days. The organization itself officially launched on January 14th, a month to the day of the tragedy. Um, I was not officially part of it at that time, although I was, I was starting to gather my thoughts and learn, learn about it. Still didn't really have any business even being out in public at that point, but um, the organization started growing from there. And, uh, and I, close to a year later, kind of really dove in, you know, full time and, and dedicated myself to the organization. It's amazing. I mean, your work is amazing, and you know, just the tirelessness and and the, um, you know, the, how how much you have done and the organization has done, and Nicole Hockney and your wife and your kids and and so many people that you have, you've galvanized a nation. I mean, you have made a great impact um, with your work. And I'm wondering, you know, you said, you know, you, you were, you had to learn about it and, you know, I'm wondering if just, I know every question I'm going to ask you about this subject is a big question, but you have been at this for 11 years. Um, and what have you found? What, what have you found out about why this is happening and um, what is needed to address it and change it? Um, so, you know, by way of background, again, um, in, in the very early days, we didn't know what to do. And me personally, I, I came from music and I just didn't understand gun culture or politics, um, both of which overlap very much uh, in this I issue that we're grappling with. Um, so there was a lot of listening and learning. And the only thing that we knew how to do at the time was to try to advocate for our federal government to pass sensible uh, firearms legislation, which was then uh, in the form of the Mansion Toomey background check bill, which was uh, hopefully going to close the loophole, the existing loophole in the federal background check system. And so that what that looked like for us was to travel to Washington and visit with uh, with the you know legislators, um, both sides of the aisle and both chambers of of Congress to to take their temperature and see where they were on this and to hopefully answer questions and to ask questions and see if we could help move them in the right direction. And we got, you know, in the Senate, more than half of them uh, agreed with it, but not enough to pass cloture, which you need more than a majority or more than half. So we, the bill didn't pass. And that was an inflection point for us to kind of uh, rethink the model and see if is, is there, while still working on that, we weren't going to give up on that. We were going to continue to see if we can get that done because Policy plays an important role in, in, in the larger fabric of all of our issues, um, but it's not the only driver. And we really wanted to see if we could examine the causes of these, act, these, these you know, disasters and, and see if there was a way we can really get upstream and learn about what's driving this violence and, uh, and figure out ways to prevent it. And that kind of evolved into a, a lot of study and research and interviewing people to try to try to get get our hands around it and to learn just to learn and um one of the key takeaways is that these things don't just happen it's not like somebody snaps and just wakes up one morning and decides to carry out a mass shooting it just really never happens that way and that's true of uh, folks who, who who um who harm themselves and it's it's true of other forms of violence that there are Pretty much, I used to say almost, but really it's, all, it's all, always there are warning signs. Um, and we imagined, can we develop a mechanism where while someone is giving off these warning signs, the folks around that person can be trained to look for, identify, and respond to those warning signs in a way that gets that person connected to whatever help or resources that they need to get on a healthier track before it becomes more serious. So really catching this stuff upstream before it's even serious warning signs or more serious warning signs. So we, through a lot more research and work and you know, my wife Jackie was uh, instrumental in helping us like 
how do you how do you reach kids? How do you reach them in a meaningful way that's sustainable? Uh, so we started developing these programs. Um, say something, as the name would imply, uh, teaches students how to recognize warning signs either in themselves or in their peers, and then connect them to a trusted adult in their network. It could be a parent or coach or faith leader or teacher who can then take those next steps and get that individual to whatever next steps they need. Uh, and it might be something that they're seeing in themselves. And it's about it's about training them with the warning signs and empowering them with the importance of you have to say something mm -hmm. and then giving them the tools with you have to say something. And I, I remember one of the first proof points that we that I witnessed firsthand was in 2015, we had trained some middle schools in Ohio and I was doing a follow up to meet with with the parents and the, and the educators and I was walking out to my 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 rental car and the guidance counselor comes running behind me very shaken and very upset and saying this is just happening now but an eighth grade girl who saw something in her social media just flipping through saw something that she identified as what she had just learned in her sandy hook promise training who said i wouldn't have thought twice about that the day before but this is exactly what they're talking about so i should do what i'm supposed to do and tell my trusted adult who was this guidance counselor who then looked into this and uncovered uh, an imminent disaster. I mean, it was just there was there was going to be a bomb in a locker and then a shooter on the hill when the school was being evacuated, and it was planned out. The web they had access to the weapons. It was ready to go. Arrests were made. I still get chills when I think about it because there's a little community in Ohio that nobody knows the name of because a horrible, you know, devastating national news story didn't come out of there because of one eighth grade girl who saw something in social media and knew what to do, and now we've seen that story replay itself many, many times. I think there are 15 credible school shootings that we can speak to that have been averted by students who have uh, learned, you know, participated in Sandy Hook Promise Say Something training. And since that time, understanding that there are barriers for students to engage because of fear of being a snitch or a rat or, or implicating themselves or somebody else, we've given them a anonymous platform where they can submit a, t a tip uh, to a crisis center and be connected in real time to a, a real live trained crisis counselor who's multilingual and a true professional. And then we connect them. They're already trained, the uh, first responders and um, all of the support network in that district are already been identified and trained. So when that tip goes to the crisis center, they know exactly where it's coming from and based on how they triage that tip, who to connect that tip to. Uh, so it's a it's a beautiful system and it's and it's we've prevented hundreds of suicides by students either reporting risk at risk behavior in a peer or from themselves and they can call three o'clock in the morning and talk to a live person who cares about them and will help them along the way or also get first responders on site immediately if it's a if it's an immediate life safety issue and the other program we have which is near and dear to my heart also near and dear to my heart because it's kind of how our little daniel lived his life and it's called start with hello and it's um, it's about training students how to look for and identify chronic social isolation in their peers and understand the difference between uh, something unhealthy and healthy alone time and connect with that student. And, and we give them icebreakers and all kinds of fun little games they can engage in to, to connect with these students because we've learned that sustained chronic social isolation uh, can uh, can lead to more serious uh, issues down the road. So if we can nip that in the bud, way upstream, you know, we can offset lots of things. So, and then, and then, as I, I mentioned earlier, like Jackie, my wife, uh, career educator, has informed us that you have to do more than just a um, a nice assembly in September with some folders to give out. You have to do more than that. It has to be sustained. It has to be part of the culture and the climate of the school. It has to be something these students are motivated to bring back home and into their communities. So we work hard on that and we build, we, we partnered with a wonderful organization out of North Carolina called SAVE, which stands for Students Against Violence Everywhere. Uh, and we build clubs into the school, into schools now, or we, or we modify an existing club and bring in the, um, our Say Something and, and Start With Hello curriculum. Uh, so it lives in the school and students participate in events all year long and, and do projects. So it really becomes part of who they are. Um, one of one of our colleagues, one of the folks in our in our organization, once said, "When when we train people, it's kind of like 
when you're the designated driver and you're going out with a group of friends. You don't go out with a three ring binder and, and refer to all the steps. What do you have to do? You just know what you have to do. And that's how we approach the training. We want these students to just know to be upstanders and not to be bystanders and to understand what these warning signs are and how to get somebody connected to whatever they need to, to, to get healthier. Wow, that is amazing. I mean, that is amazing work. Con uh, congratulations. And, well, thank you, and thank you for, for doing this. This is um, so important. And J Jackie is so right. It really does have to become part of the culture. And, you know, I, I know you're working hard to get that message out and to get it into schools across America. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, how is that going? How, how are, how are communities um, receiving this? The communities, we, we um, one, of, one of our fortunate challenges is to meet the demand um, yeah. is in, in that in the communities across the nation understand the value of, of what we're able to bring. We bring these programs to the schools at no cost to the schools, thanks to the generosity of our donors. And, you know, for next steps, we are, we are embarking on a, on a lofty mission to now dive deeper into the communities that we are serving and learn more about what their specific particular challenges are and how to address them, bringing in trainers from the neighborhoods that we are, are serving so that they understand the culture that the students are, are existing in and how to respond to that in a more meaningful way so that we can have a deeper level of engagement resulting in better outcomes. And we're studying all this through formalized research. Uh, but we're building this in a, now we're going deeper so we can really reach these students on an individual basis based on the communities that they're living in and then learn how to replicate that in other communities. So for example, we are uh, starting a very ambitious pilot program. Uh, we are already engaged in the pilot program in District 9 in the Bronx, which mm -hmm. is uh, part of the behemoth that is the New York City school system. Mm -hmm. And um, District 9, just District 9 in the Bronx, uh, is is a very diverse range uh, of, uh, of cultures across the district and challenges and um, opportunities that, that we are engaging in that community so that we can really have a deeper level of engagement and, and see that reflected in better outcomes. That's amazing. That's so great. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I bet a lot of people listening are, are wondering how they can help and how they can get involved. So the, the, yeah, thank you for that. And, and, that, and that's really, that's what fuels the organization is, is folks who, who, who can bring whatever they have to, to, to help the organization do its work. Like I said, we, we don't charge anything, but it's a tremendous resource expenditure on our part to do this work and to do these trainings and to do the sustained trainings and the recurrent trainings and, and really build this into the schools and the, in, the, in the communities in a meaningful way. Um, and, and it takes more than just money. So if folks are able to donate, um, you know, that, that goes right into the programs. It goes right back into the research. It goes right back into the building out the strategic plan and, and bringing in the staff that's required to make that happen. Um, but they can also donate their time. Uh, and we have um, our super volunteers, we call them promise leaders, and they're a tremendous resource. And, and, and you know, we are also working on a plan to get better at how we engage them and get, get them more meaningfully engaged in the organization at a deeper level. Um, and so what's the old adage, time, treasure, talent, you know, so, so whatever it is folks can bring. Um, and, you know, even if it's not Sandy Hook Promise, if, if you're not involved with this issue of the epidemic of gun violence in America, get involved with whatever organization resonates with your own values or in your own community. Um, there are community-based violence intervention programs across the country, many of which are in underserved communities in the urban areas that need help. Um, right. So so it's it's important to, to spend a little time and look some of that up and see how you can how you can help. And you know, of course, we all have to vote. It's it's our it's our duty uh, to to vote and to vote for candidates who reflect the values that you want to see uh, in your communities. So true. So true. Um, you know, I, I remember talking to you after the uh, Mansion Toomey bill did not pass, and and our, and you know, I think that was a real a real shock, and. Um, yeah. And we have had some movement with uh, recently with the 
President Biden um, has we passed the Bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act in 2022. Mm -hmm. And it's got a long way to go, I know, but um, you know, that that has been in large part to this, you know, growing group of across the nation that um, is is fighting you know, to bring sensible gun legislation um, and and prevent gun violence. And um, where where are you with all of that? Where, where do you think we're headed with gun legislation? Yeah. So you know, when I first started working in this in this space um, back in 2013. 14, um, it was the third rail issue for um, policymakers and legislators to run on. <clears throat> it was to be avoided, it was to be pivoted from. Um, and I've seen uh, a, a tremendous change now in uh, how Americans respond to this issue. Unfortunately, a lot of it is being driven by tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Uh, but it also is being driven by um, a, a formidable um, organizational movement that um, so many organizations have come into being since the tragedy at Sandy Hook um, and have grown and have gotten better and more re better resourced and are, are having a, a tangible impact. And, and it's being now reflected in, um, you know, on campaign platforms where we are seeing policymakers who are either embracing it or at least not shying away from it um, right. on both sides of the aisle. And I'll, and I'll say mm -hmm. it's being it's been recognized. Uh, and and we need to see more of that. We need to see constituents holding their policymakers accountable, um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with phone calls and emails and letters and then at the polls. Uh, and so, uh, to your point, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was was a tremendous um, effort, and and, and it, there is so much significance in that that goes beyond the actual efficacy of the language of the bill, which is also very good. There mm -hmm. were some great provisions, and you know, admittedly, it's a start. But what it also, what's I think important to recognize, Laura, is it didn't only pass with bipartisan support, but it set a precedent yeah. that we can pass me meaningful violence pre pre uh, pre prevention uh, policy with bipartisan support. And the sky didn't fall and nobody lost their right to own a firearm should they choose to do so. Yeah. Uh, it also provided a lot of resources and funding for those underserved violence intervention programs and communities that we speak about. It also provides a, a lot of um, bolstering of our mental health system and, and help folks get access to quality. There's, we, have, we have students in our save clubs that have to drive over two hours to get mental health support in, in, you know, in a face-to-face -face situation. Uh, so the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act makes progress toward that, but it, it's all a good start. It's all proven, proven that you know, nothing fell apart and exploded because of it, um, and it's... It, it does do a lot of good and it sets a healthy precedent that we can continue to move in that direction in a bipartisan way with all hands on deck for the greater good of the American citizens. Absolutely. Really well said. And, and to your point, vote, really vote and hold your, you know, senators and um, congressmen and women accountable. Absolutely. Vote and also let them know, and also tell them when they're doing the right thing. When you know, acknowledge that too. A lot of folks, they in you know, a lot of legislators hear only like, "Why didn't you do this?" or "Why aren't you better at that?" and they need to hear that. But they also need to be appreciated and acknowledged when they are doing the right thing. And some of them are sticking their necks out against party lines and doing the right thing, even though they it could cost them their 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 seat. They're still doing it. That should be acknowledged. Uh, and yes, by all means, vote. And not only in the big, sexy, you know, national election. But, but vote in in your local elections. That's really important too. Right down in your communities. That's important. It's extremely important. Maybe more important. Actually, know. yes. I think you're right. <laughs> you know, Ground up. Uh, Ground up. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, Mark, we talked uh, briefly at the beginning about your music, and you mentioned how um, you know you you became focused understandably with Sandy Hook Promise and music um, took a, a, a well a backseat and what and what people probably don't know but will know now is that you know I know you through music you're my dear longtime friend from we started together we were playing together clubs and touring together and you're on my records and 
you know, I moved to San Francisco and had my career and you moved to Nashville and had a remarkable um, career and, um, and you're back, you're back playing. I'm so excited. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Always never, never a guitar far away, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is good to be back, Laura, and I appreciate that. And and yeah, let me just reflect on all that that, that history that you just mentioned. I I don't I know that you don't know how how often I really fondly reflect on all the the great stuff we've done musically um, with recording and touring, and how much that's part of me and and in my heart and always will be. So just just know that, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that when we're not on your podcast on your podcast, but, um, <laughs> you know, and it was more, more than just logistics. It was probably more than mostly not just about logistics. My, my departure from music was because so much more was it emotional because James and Natalie and Daniel were very connected to my music. And Daniel as a little toddler crawling around would crawl up to a speaker and put his ear to it and touch it. He wanted to kind of know where the sound was coming in. And he's like, before he could even speak or walk, he was, just cute in our music. And I mean, I have a lot of stories about Daniel and his music. He was the drummer in our little family band with James and Natalie and me. He played drums uh, for for their grandfather's 90th birthday party. And Natalie sang What a Wonderful World to their grandfather in a beautiful moment. Um, and what was to be the last day of his life, he asked me to teach him how to play something on the piano out of the middle of nowhere. and. Um, taught him how to play jingle bells and he played it so well so naturally that i was just so i was like this guy this guy is going to be an amazing musician you know and that was that was the morning of december 14 2012. so and even with my students i'd have students come to the house for lessons and daniel was so excited about that he'd open the door and he'd let them in and he'd show them to the little studio and ask them if they wanted a drink of water and um he was very respectful of that, uh, of my time with the students and wanted to be part of it. So for those reasons and more, I don't want uh, thanks for indulging me already, but um, there, I just, I couldn't, couldn't even get near music. It was just too painful because, um, because of those threads were so tightly knit that, and it's still, I mean, I'm just going to tell you, it's, there's still a lot of that that comes along with music and it'll always be there. Now it's been woven into my music and, um, so it's been a process, you know, uh, um, and, and so, so many wonderful people in my music life are just wonderful people and great friends and have been sort of holding my hand and supporting me, you know, figuratively and literally all the way through this. And, um, and, and, and yeah, and, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I, I do have so much uh, to thank Rick Korn, filmmaker Rick Korn for, who, who, who embarked on this mission, which originally started out as a way to examine the role of music and healing after profound tragedy and has more evolved into something more focused more closely on my experience um but it has it has afforded me this very natural organic way um to kind of bring music back into my life in 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 the way that it's supposed to be and in a way that's brings all the meaning with it now it's not like forcing myself to go out and do gigs it's like it's it's got all this i do that too but it's bringing all this additional, very deep meaning, and I and I have so much respect and appreciation for Rick, um, kind of, um, kind of leading me in, into this and, and offering these opportunities. Well, you know, I, I've spoken with Rick, and I'm I want to have you guys back on when when the film's out and when we're, you're promoting. You have a lot coming up, so you're not jumping ahead. There's a lot going on. Um, and he's just a wonderful guy and you know you've kindly shared the film with me and it's a beautiful beautiful tribute and um a film that i i think people will be inspired in seeing and they're going to learn a lot and um and they're going to get to see some amazing people play in including you so the film that mark is talking about is called a father's promise and it really covers um, your work, you know, in the last 11 years, your life, your family's life, Jackie's in it, you know, your kids are in it. And it, 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 and, and it tells the story of what you've accomplished 
both in your um, activism and in your road back to music. And, I, you know, I just will say, you know, I share a similar, uh, you know, leaving music due to, a, you know, it, tragedy. And when it, you know, and it, it takes a long time to come back from that. But when you, you know, it's also so healing and my connection with you is very healing for me. So, you know, so it's, so it's amazing to, to be, be able to talk to you about this and also to be, you know, to be here as you, you know, reemerge and are play, sharing the stage with a, an amazing house band, uh, Jimmy Vivino's, uh, the, mm -hmm. the house band for the Promise Band. You've got yeah. Cheryl Crow uh, playing um, and, and so many others. So uh, let's talk about the concert. The, the film is released December 8th in New yes. York City. That's the premiere. And then it, it goes national uh, after that. And well, your kickoff concert, um, I'm not sure if you have the venue set yet, some talk of the Beacon Theater in New York, but possibly another venue. And Cheryl Crow's going to be there. Um, I've got other people's names. Uh, Young the Giant is going to be there, and a, probably a whole host of artists. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's very exciting. It's rooted in, in deep messaging and meaning. Um, and yeah, and Cheryl Crow is the executive producer of the film. Um, right. I've known Cheryl over probably six years, maybe now we've been, she, um, she wanted to become involved with, with Sandy, her promise. And she, she did, a, she performed at our five year rem remembrance. Uh, and, and then, um, also, uh, gave a song to Sandy, her promise. And, uh, and we've stayed in touch musically and advocacy wise over the years. And then um she uh she really kind of um believes in this this uh film and the message and, and the tone of the message and uh and has signed on to be the executive producer which is such a wonderful honor you know to be to be part of this with her and you know to, to have her as a friend to to bounce ideas off of and to talk to things about um but karen fairchild from little big town is also yeah. Uh, very much involved in this and another amazing talent you know now fast forward to our 10-year remembrance that we just had this past December and um and I and I asked I asked um Karen if she would you know be part of that with us you know and it was it was the 10-year remembrance was in New York City and we had Barack Obama and Matthew McConaughey and Bob Iger but uh, then we had our annual gala in in Washington DC and um in june of this year and i asked her would you would you want to try a new thing i'm, I'm going to bring music into our into our gala event in washington for the first time and would, would you want to do that with me and she said yep so we we did our we, we did a little acoustic duo together for the um for the for our gala in washington in june it was such a treat um so she's very much involved with the film as anywhere i'm, I'm digressing get me talking about you don't talk about music and it'll just go right off the rails, my friend, as you know. <laughs> you're, you're not digressing at all. You're, 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 uh, you're not. Uh, Derek Trucks is part of the film. Susan Tedeschi is part of the film. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think one of, one of my, the secret, like, little ha joys for me in the film is how um, everyone's like, Wow, Mark's a great player. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, like, like you're, you are a, uh, you're a high class musician, dear, um, <laughs> and uh, you are, you've got chops, <laughs> you've got chops, and uh, and you display, and they are on display in the film, so that's exciting, um, and you know, another really j just a beautiful moment is um, your daughter, who is such a talent. And it's so, so beautiful and has such a beautiful voice and she's singing. How, yes. how lovely. And I should name now that, that, um, that the, the hidden ta talent that you don't get to see in the film is James is also uh, a wonderfully gifted musician and singer um, has really, you know, not much interest in doing that out loud in public, but I get to know about it and it's a wonderful treat for me. And we'll get the three of us together again, but yes, it is such a treat. I cannot, articulate effectively enough what a treat it is for me to do gigs with with Natalie whether 
you know, whether it's um, whether it's in, a, in the pub down the street or, you know, at the Beacon Theater with Sheryl Crow. I just, yeah. you know, funny story. We did uh, part of the documentary pro process project was the docu concert we did at City Winery in Nashville with mm -hmm. Cheryl. And both Cheryl and um, Karen Fairchild not only wanted to have Natalie sing with them, but asked her to do a verse of one of their songs where Natalie just takes a whole verse to herself. And then Cheryl said, no, no, sing on the mic with me. And such a kick to watch all that transpire. But Cheryl says to me, he, she says, when Natalie comes up to sing, I'm going to be leaning on you because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to melt. And I'm like, don't even look at me. I'm like, don't <laughs> lean on me because I'm, I'm going to be already gone. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was very yeah. special to have my little sweepy there. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's so much going on. I mean, we really, we're like scratching the surface. There's a yeah. docu-series. You're going to be, the Promise Band is going on the road and you're going to be playing um, concerts in different cities. We're getting you out here in the San Francisco Bay Area, for Love sure. That. I'm and, me too. And you're raising money. These concerts are raising money for grassroots nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. the organizations in the communities that are working to um, stop gun violence. And I just, I just admire you so much for for all the energy you have for this. And that is such an important and worthwhile cause. So I, you know. Well, those organizations are so important and worthwhile and they need to be lifted up and supported and people need to know about them. And, you know, that's part of that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to Artists for Action maybe in, in, in the next one of these because it's, it's a fledgling startup organization that's going to also help, um, you know, curate awareness and education and, and funds and uh, help. For those for those organizations as well and that will yeah. be sort of in concert upon with with the, the music project and sort of connected to the documentary well we'll have we're going to have um links to artists for action to um sandy hook promise and to the film so that people can find out more and i am excited about artists for action and that is artist that is not plural so there's no s it's artist for action.com right. And that is an amazing project too. And it's all related and it's all coming from you, <laughs> you know, with the help of many, many people I know that oh my are, gosh. Yeah. you know, you are catalyzed. This is, a I, I could go on, I, I could go on and on about the incredible people that are drawn to Sandy Hook Promise uh, as staff employees and as volunteers who just bring their genuine talent and, and passion and expertise to this work and they are really why the organization is as successful as as it is their their, their brilliant strategy no other organization is writing is writing you know mental health community safety school safety gun violence prevention policy at the state and federal level and getting it passed with bipartisan support nobody else can do that and it's because of the amazing people that work in this organization and the and the programs that we bring and the and the way that they are implemented and strategically sustained is all thanks to the smart thinking and the great people that work for Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, so I should, I, I have to name that. I, could, I couldn't sit here and, and absorb all these accolades without naming that. Yeah, uh, and, and you, you're always, you, you always do uh, recognize that. And um, I'm, I'm just, you know, in awe really of everything that um, is happening. Um, and count me in, like, Count me in, yeah. however, wherever, whenever I can help. I will be at that Beacon Theater show. So you know, I'll bring yeah. you guys whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, and and hopefully all your all your your listeners and viewers on on your podcast will will, will come away from this saying "Count me in" too, because there's lots yeah. of ways you can be counted in. Lots of ways. Yeah, yeah. Any any other things you want to say about that before we? Uh, just that just to keep in mind because it can be i mean when we're recording this we're 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 in the we're the, you know the, the in the aftermath of a weekend of horrible violence in this country um yeah. one of which uh, an, another another shopping store where where people were targeted for being black and shot mm -hmm. to death and it's so it's it's 
almost impossible to not be completely discouraged and put your hands in the air like what the, what's going on and how do we but we can and it, and it sounds like a catchphrase and it, and it is but it's also really what this boils down to remember we've talked about how there are always warning signs and because of there because there are always warning signs it is preventable there are opportunities to intervene and what it boils down to is that gun violence in America is not inevitable it is preventable and if we all really work together and and just make this one of the things that you do it doesn't have to be the only thing you do but if it becomes one of the things you do we can make that difference and we can get on the other side of this and right. Laura thank you for giving me the opportunity to run my mouth on your show for this long and then for <laughs> the opportunity to, to share the work that's being done by my organization and other wonderful organizations and that there are op uh, there are opportunities for everyone to be part of the solution so thank you for doing this Laura. and and thank you for taking the time mark i know you are busy you have a lot going on and we have really just scratched the surface so i look forward to having you back i look forward to having rick on and i'm Great. so excited about the film um just getting the word out and the concerts they're going to coming to a town near you so uh and if they're not make, make make it happen make some phone calls and get involved and get us get us to a conference because we come to a city we can raise a lot of awareness and do a lot of good and bring folks out out from the community and bring them some great music so if, if you want to see this happen in your town let us know yeah that's right that's right well thank you again mark and we will um and until next time and um yeah. we will we will we will talk again soon and I'm going to see you soon. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, same here, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much.